Good morning to everybody or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world and welcome to the Power of Mindfulness session, which is part of our Power of Arts and Science Week. I am Shanti Parikh, Chair of African and African American Studies and Professor of Anthropology in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I will serve as your moderator for this very exciting event. Arts and Sciences is the heart and soul of Washington University. The teaching, research, and other activities within Arts and Sciences impact the lives far beyond our campus. And this series is a celebration of that. I am so pleased that you have joined us today to hear from two of my exciting colleagues. This year, many of the events in the Power of Arts and Sciences Week were inspired by our strategic plan, which was made public this past Monday. In the plan, we define our existing strengths, identify opportunities for growth, and articulate a shared vision. One of the priorities we've named in our strategic plan is connecting our teaching, research, and discoveries with the world outside of academia and to the communities that surround us. And another one of our goals is to push the boundaries between disciplines. Today's event is a perfect example of both of these. Today, you'll hear about the psychological benefits of mindfulness, what it is, and particularly in connection to anti-racism efforts. I now introduce you to two of my dynamic and award-winning colleagues who will be presenting their work. Todd Brader is Professor of Radiology, Neuroscience, and Psychological and Brain Sciences. His research seeks to understand how humans exert control over their thoughts and behavior, and how this control can break down. His work focuses on the cognitive and neural mechanisms underlying memory, attention, and controlled processing. Diana Para Perez is a research assistant professor in the Brown School here at Washington University. She is a mindfulness expert and facilitator for the Washington University Academy for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Her research focuses on the promotion of health and wellness through community-based programs for physical activity, nutrition, yoga, and mindfulness geared towards underrepresented groups, particularly the Latinx immigrant population in the United States. Todd and Diana have worked together for a while. They are co-chairs for the Center for Race, for the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equities, Mindfulness, and Anti-Racism Working Group. The goal of this work is to incubate and generate intellectual exchange, facilitate deeper and broader understandings of the research topic, and catalyze innovative ideas about mindfulness and anti-racism. We'll first hear from each of our panelists and then take questions from you, our audience. Feel free to use the Q&A box during the presentation to submit your questions. Please join me in welcoming both Dr. Todd Braver and Diana Perez, uh, uh, Diana Para Perez. Todd Braver will go first, and I now turn it over to Todd. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shanti, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks to uh, Tony and Kathy and the Arts and Sciences team for putting on this, these great series of events. And uh, most of all, uh, thanks to all of you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to, to join us, even though we're virtual. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to have the opportunity to, to share some, some ideas about mindfulness with you. Let me uh, share my screen right now. And there we go. So now, um, and yes, I'm gonna talk about mindfulness. And I think, you know, any uh, discussion of mindfulness really has to proceed from firsthand experience. So um, I'm gonna start right from there and I invite you all and, and hope you'll allow me to have us join in an exercise that we can do together. 
So what I'd like us to do is to do just a short, what we call breath awareness exercise. It's, it's very simple. We're just going to be um, breathing normally and silently counting our breaths. So at each exhale, we'll increment a count from one to nine. And when you get to nine, you can, can just uh, start over again at one. And it's fine if you lose your place, if you just detect that that's happened, just start back at one again. And um, we'll do this uh, silently for about two minutes. Um, and you can feel free if you'd like to turn off your video, I'll let you know it's done. And, and if it's more comfortable for you, feel free to also close your eyes. Okay, so we're ready to begin this together. Okay, let's start counting. Okay, we can stop now. And so I'd like, you know, take a moment and reflect upon what that experience was like for you. What did you notice during that? Maybe you found that it was um, relaxing. Maybe you felt your heart rate and breathing slowing down. Maybe you felt yourself a little bit more aware of the present moment, felt grounded to that and what it's like to be you right now. Um, maybe you also though noticed that felt like longer than two minutes. Uh, maybe um, you got a little agitated or your mind started wandering a bit or you're wondering, maybe was this a good use of my time to be doing this? I've got a lot of other things going on in my life. So even a simple exercise just like this, um, you know, has a requirement that we control attention and, and know where that is, is our attention on our breath. Are we able to kind of increment the count or is it going somewhere else? Um, and there's lots of temptation sometimes for, uh, for mind wandering, for us to get distracted or to zone out. Um, in our daily lives, we know that uh, we can go on autopilot, we can get distracted, we can zone out. Um, and so this, this kind of tendency for mind wandering that sometimes happens, you know, we want to also understand what's the contrast between that. Um, and the opposite, you know, of mind wandering as you might, you know, be expecting this talk might, you might want to think of that as being mindfulness. And so, you know, what is a good definition for mindfulness? Um, this is one that was put forward by um, John Kabat-Zinn, who I'll mention a little bit um, later, is uh, probably one of the pioneers of, of mindfulness, at least in the United States. I mean, he has a really interesting definition where he puts uh, attention very front forward here. Mindfulness being, means paying attention, but in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So these kind of three characteristics, there's this kind of intention, quality to attention 
and they're this kind of importance of being in the present moment. I like, by the way, that everybody's putting nice um, uh, comments here in the chat. Um, and, uh, and then the non-judgmental, being more detached um, about our attention, maybe kind of just being curious about where it is. So even if you hadn't had that much experience previously with um, uh, the you know mindfulness, or you probably have heard of the term at least, and this is you know it is a term that's becoming much more um, common and well known. And um, you know over the last decade, I think we've really had an explosion of interest in it. This is kind of marked by this cover of Time magazine that came out in 2014. And so we can kind of say, ask ourselves, why is there so much interest in mindfulness? And what they um, you know, argued in this particular article and many others is the idea here that you know, we're uh, in a period of time, I don't need to tell everybody with this pandemic period that we have a lot of stresses in our lives, that a lot of competition for our attention, a lot of information overload, a lot of demands to be able to multitask. And so there's this concern that maybe um, you know, we need some ability to cope with those demands more effectively um, and the, the effects that it can have on us. And so there's a thought that uh, mindfulness might be a really important tool in this. And part of the other interest is because um, there's been actually really in dramatic increase in the science of mindfulness. And so that's what I'd like to tell you a little bit more in my talk here. So, um, you know, these concepts actually are, are quite old, according to um, some of the Buddhist texts, which are thought to kind of be describing the original um, practices, they're at least 2,500 years old, if not older than that. Um, but really the scientific research on mindfulness has only um, really kind of started in the last 20 years. Um, and as I mentioned, John Kabat-Zinn is considered one of the pioneers. He developed a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is an eight week standardized course that he developed at the University of Massachusetts, which in a kind of clinical and medical context for, for patients that he was encountering that were having you know, um, uh, problems that weren't really dealt with by standard medical treatments and found that really this program could be quite effective in a, in, for a lot of different um, groups. And, um, started publishing his work and, and that's become very influential and led to um, an explosion of research studies on uh, MBSR, but also other mindfulness practices and, and effects and interventions. And it's really just completely exploded in the last few years. As I show here, there's been 3000 papers just in the last five years and more papers published just in, the, in 2018. The last, it was really directly recorded in the 30 years all previously combined. So lots of interest. And now we're starting to accumulate some pretty good evidence about um, effects that are beneficial and, and seem to hold up to scientific scrutiny as being reliable and robust. So now it's, it's, there's pretty good evidence that uh, mindfulness can really help with enhanced mood and psychological well-being. So people report reductions in anxiety and depression increases in positive affect and satisfaction with life. And also the physiological level, seeing markers of reduced stress and increased physiological resilience, things like improved sleep quality, better management of pain, enhanced immune function, even. And I'll mention a little bit about that in just a moment. Um, and then at the cognitive level, which is something that I'm quite interested in, that's, that's my area of research, uh, evidence for improved concentration and, and actually some effects that are related to, to mind one and that I'll tell you about in just a moment. Um, people have been interested in what are the possible mechanisms of action and, and posited that there might be three particular dimensions or routes by which mindfulness is improving our ability to self-regulate our thoughts and behaviors and psychological functioning. Um, and one, attention control, and that's what I'm gonna spend um, the rest of the time talking about. And then other dimensions that relate to regulation of our emotion and awareness of where ourselves are and understanding of ourselves in relationship to others. Um, and this is gonna be the focus of my partner Deanna's talk after me. So I'll let her describe that more. But in terms of attention control, um, it's been really interesting. So even with that breath counting exercise that we just did, you, they've, researchers have turned that into a task where we can measure accuracy at that. And in this study, they actually had people where they periodically probed them and said, 
where was your mind right now? Was it on the breath counting task or was it zoned out or distracted? And maybe not surprising that the people that actually um, tended to report that they were um, unaware um, or zoned out, they actually had lower counting accuracy in a task like that. Maybe a little bit more surprising, um, but important for us is the idea that um, people that were had practiced mindfulness meditation were actually significantly more accurate on average than those that were not. So that is, they had an easier time maintaining their attention on their breath and counting. You know, maybe even more surprising was that this counting accuracy was actually moderately correlated with reports of, of affect. So people that had higher affect, or sorry, higher accuracy reported um, more positive affect than those that had lower uh, accounting accuracy. And I wanna tell you, switch to the brain and tell you about an important brain network, which is called the default mode network. Um, and this is a network that's actually uh, in, interest in this really was pioneered here at WashU by some of the, the really uh, outstanding neuroscientists that we have here in our community. And they discovered this kind of network of midline brain regions that were found to be very highly metabolically active when folks were just resting, when they were not doing anything in particular. And in fact, the opposite was true when they had their attention externally focused on doing um, cognitive or experimental tasks that the activity decreased. And so this suggests that there you know, might be some important functions in this kind of default mode is the idea that maybe this is just what's happening um, as this, act, this network is active, you know, just at the default in our kind of baseline state. Um, people were interested in this in respect to mind wandering though. And in this study, what they did is they had people do a kind of sustained attention task. But again, periodically they asked them, was your mind on the task or off task? And what they found is that when people reported that they were zoned out or mind wandering, they looked right before they, they responded, they found an increase in these same brain regions that were part of the default mode network, suggesting that mind wandering might be associated with increases in this DMN brain network. And then interestingly, this was also now studied in relationship to, to mindfulness and meditation. And this is, a, uh, sorry, I, mean, just, I forgot one other thing to tell you is that there are um, other brain networks besides the default mode network. And one of the really interesting one um, is what's called the frontal parietal network or frontal FPN. And what's been found is that this network actually tends to be out of phase or anti-correlated with the DMN. So this blue trace here refers to a, a brain regions in the FPN. And you can see this is just spontaneous fluctuations when um, during um, task or rest periods. And we can see that when there's activity in the FPN, there's reduced activity in the DMN and vice versa, suggesting that maybe for the average person, these, these networks act as kind of competitor brain networks. But um, when studying this with regard to meditators, um, this was a really interesting study conducted by Judd Brewer, who actually um, received his MD PhD here at WashU. And then afterward um, conducted this study where he had um, people practice uh, different mindfulness practices while looking at their, their resting state brain activity and found that in meditators for all three of the practices, these are these different bars, there was reduced activity um, in this DMN, whereas for the controls, the novices, they actually tend to have slightly increased activity, suggesting that maybe these mindfulness uh, meditators were not mind wandering and engaging this network in the same way that the, the novices were. Um, but also interesting, he found that there was increased connectivity between this DMN and nodes within the FPN network. This is looking at the, these two core nodes in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And actually connectivity between the DMN and the FPN was increased in the meditators, but not in the controls. And this suggests that maybe in these two, uh, in this group of meditators, that these networks became more cooperative rather than competitive. And you know, this study maybe helps us understand that. In, in this study, they actually had um, people press a button. These were meditators and they were um, told to maintain attention to their breath for an extended period, but also to press a button when they noticed that their mind had wandered away. And what they found is during those periods, right before they press a button consistent with the study I told you before, there was increased activity in the default mode network, but right after it, there was an activity in these attention networks, including the FPN, 
that seem to be involved in kind of re detecting that mind wandering and then reorienting or shifting attention back toward the breath. So this suggests that these two networks really maybe do need to work more effectively together so that we can detect when our attention is kind of veered off from our object of focus and we can reorient it back in. And so maybe one of the, the ideas about mindfulness meditation is it helps us train these networks to cooperate better together so that we can be more aware of where our attention is and reorient it when it gets um, veered off or when we're mind wandering. And even more interesting, this is a study that was done that looked at um, people that were, went through a mindfulness training program or a, a kind of an active control when they just um, experienced uh, training and relaxation. And again, they, this, the group that had mindfulness training showed increased connectivity between the nodes of the DMN and in the FPN. But even more interesting, they found that that, that change in connectivity that increased predicted a change in an important um, marker of clinical health. This is the interleukin-6 marker, which is an inflammation marker that goes up when people are stressed and goes down as they increase psychological well-being. So this suggests that there's important implications, not just for attention, but maybe for health and physiological function by improving the cooperation between these two networks. And I'm just going to tell you briefly about a study that we were doing, we've I've been doing in my lab and it's still actually ongoing and it's a complex study, but our key idea was we were interested in um, trying to provide even more rigorous control for this effect. So we actually were studying identical twins where we had one uh, member of the twin pair um, engage in the MBSR course and the other member was a weightless control. So they got to do it after the study was over. And we scanned their brains both before and after that period. And we were interested in studying all kinds of aspects of attention control that we're still analyzing right now. But just to tell you briefly, this was work by my uh, former graduate student, Catherine Tang, who did for a dissertation, that we replicated this finding and found it was to be pretty selective that the, the twin member that went through the MBSR course, these, each line is, is them before versus after, they showed increase in the FPN DMN connectivity after training relative before. And that same change was not observed in their co-twin over that same interval. So this really does support the idea that these effects are somewhat selective and specific to mindfulness training. So now you might be wondering, well, how can I you know, learn more and engage in, in mindfulness practices that I'm interested? Well, if you're uh, lucky enough to be a student at WashU and a first year student, you can actually take a course on it. In fact, that's the course that I teach and I'll be teaching again in the spring semester. It's called uh, Mindfulness Science and Practice and it's offered to first year students. I've been doing it now for about five years. Um, and um, in the class, we learn and practice different mindfulness skills um, each class together and discuss them and report upon our experiences. But we also read um, papers about uh, mindfulness research and discuss the science. And um, interestingly, we, we treat ourselves like, um, you know, participants and scientists where we assess ourselves before at the beginning of the semester and at the end. So we can see with these measures of psychological well-being and attention control, is there any change? And um, we, in the past, we've actually compared ourselves to a control group and uh, Tim Bono, who's another professor in psychological and brain sciences, teaches a great course called Psychology of Young Adulthood where the students learn a lot of strategies to help uh, become more academically successful and, and better uh, managing their time, but uh, no mindfulness training. So we thought it was a good control group. And then we looked at, compare the results. Um, I should also say that, you know, I won't really go through this, but students that take the mindfulness course, I'm very gratified that they really um, get a lot of benefit and report that they find it to be a really important course. The student wrote those maybe even life-changing in terms of how they dealt with stress. And they felt that they learned skills and practices that helped them in their future stresses. And, you know, nicely, we also found more uh, objective evidence of that. We found evidence that there was improvement in satisfaction of life, in markers of mindfulness, in self-report anxiety that were, you know, so strong and selectively present just in the, in the students that were taking our course. Um, you know, with regard to the attention effects that we actually found that they were not really selective. We found modest improvements, but they were 
found in both courses. And so, you know, there's a lot of reasons to think of this. Of, of course, um, you know, both classes were teaching skills that might improve attention. Um, and also uh, WashU students are, are very high functioning, so might be very good at attention to begin with. But this is really encouraging to say that learning about uh, mindness is really important, can have strong benefits and we can, you know, have this even in the classroom environment. So I'm going to stop there and now um, turn it over to my partner, Deanna Pera Perez, who's professor, uh, research assistant professor in the Brown School, who's going to take it over from here and talk about um, other aspects of mindfulness and particularly um, results of compassion training and how they might be useful for understanding um, uh, prejudice and bias. So I'll let uh, Deanna take it over from there. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, and speaking of embracing the moment, right? As, of, as I was getting ready to talk, uh, there's someone blowing leaves outside. So I apologize for the noise, for the background noise. Uh, but just like Todd did, um, that started us with a, a, a practice, I'm going to do the same. Um, so for these, just please find a comfortable position that feels good for you. Ideally, a uh, position that allows you to have your back straight. And in meditation, we work with this concept between not too rigid and not too loose. So just a position that feels natural for you. Just allowing your breathing to settle. Just embracing everything about this moment, even the loud noises outside your window or through the camera. So just letting your body settle here and you can close your eyes if that feels more comfortable for you, but you can also keep a very soft gaze And as you begin to settle here, I invite you to bring to mind someone that you love dearly. Someone for whom your heart naturally warms and opens. And this can be a family member, it can be a friend, it can also be a pet or it could be a spiritual being or a benefactor. So once you have this image very clear in your mind, you can really begin to connect with their presence. And I will guide us through a few phrases that you would repeat mentally for them. These are phrases that send them wishes for their well-being, loving kindness. May you be safe. May you be healthy. May you be happy. May you be at ease. Connecting deeply with the feeling of sending these heartful wishes to this person or this being that you love. And just allowing everything that appears to be here. It could be feelings of sadness, maybe if you miss this person, or it could be just feelings of joy and happiness. Just noticing and allowing everything to be here.
inviting you now gently to let go of the image of this person or this being. Seeing now your own image in your mind. You will begin to repeat the same phrases directed towards yourself. Noticing if there is any resistance to do this. And if there is, you can imagine that first person or that being that you connected with in the first step. You can imagine them sending these phrases to you. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I be happy. May I be peaceful. And again, noticing here anything that has arise. Maybe any thoughts or feelings of not feeling worthy of those wishes or any sort of doubt or resistance. And just welcoming them here. Inviting you to reconnect again with the sense of breathing and letting go of your image at this point. Sensing the movements of your breath, the expansion and contraction of the belly and the chest as you breathe. were closed very gently beginning to open them and inviting gentle movement back into your body so I will share my screen now with the slides that I have prepared for today and again I apologize for the perfect timing <laughs> This is uh, actually a very real life experience of how mindfulness can help us uh, keep our center and deal with things that we can't control, which most of the time we actually can't. So that's actually how our, our, our life is. Um, so we got a, a taste of um, loving kindness. That's the practice that we just did. We did a loving kindness meditation. And just to recap some of what Todd uh, was talking about, I will be mostly focusing on the three pillars of mind training as specifically relates to kind intention. Uh, but the, the three pillars of mind training uh, are focused attention, which uh, Todd kind of targeted during his presentation, as well as open awareness and then kind intention. So I will mostly be talking about the second, the open awareness and the kind intention. So for the kind intention, uh, which we are talking about the ability to have a state of mind with positive regard and self-compassion. So for the practice that we did, I will be curious to hear, you can type in in the chat, um, things that came up um, normally it is very difficult for us to send those wishes to ourselves. Um, and this is why we begin with a person that we love uh, or a benefactor or a being for whom our heart naturally warms and opens. Um, and it's just something that we are not thought. And compassion and self-compassion is really that thing that allows us to open to the world and to realize our interconnectedness. Um, so kind intention is also known as the ability to, to have compassion for others, not just for ourselves. And it is kind of known as that middle way between 
very being very disengaged and cold um, and sometimes cynical and the opposite which is getting so involved emotionally that we become vulnerable to burnout and compassion fatigue so that middle way allows us to connect to the feelings of others but in a way that um, allows for an intelligent and compassionate response so what are some of the benefits that have been um, known and proved, proven with research uh, of compassion and loving kindness practices it creates more empathy it creates greater feelings of love appreciation and acceptance towards ourselves and others um, increased feelings of self-compassion it also reminds us of our interconnection or interdependence um, it connects us with a sense of purpose in life and a deep connection with positive emotions it reduces feelings of loneliness and separation and it also uh, is a practice that can increase our sympathetic joy which is really feeling happy for the good things that happen to other people um, but but genuinely not just oh i'm so happy you got that promotion right like we really do feel that we are happy uh, for for what for the good things that happen to others even if they don't happen for us and just to recap, um, that practice that we did at the beginning, we did it for someone for whom our heart naturally opens and then for ourselves. But this is a practice that we can extend to people that are neutral to us. Um, we also can extend this practice to people with whom we have a difficult relationship or conflict um, and also to the larger world. So. Um, I'm going to skip this, this, this presentation because I know we're, we're running short on time, but the, uh, the main three components of self-compassion are self-kindness, which is, um, as I mentioned before, being warm and understanding towards ourselves, our common humanity, which is realizing that we are interconnected, that you know what happens to my neighbor will also affect me. Um, and then the mindfulness, the mindfulness um, component, which is what we practice uh, at the beginning also with thought, the ability to know and to be in the present moment, to know what is happening as is happening. Uh, so what are some of the myths of self-compassion um, and why this practice is sometimes very hard for people, especially in a culture that is very competitive, in a culture where um, you know, you're judged sometimes just in your results, in your prestige, in your titles and promotions, um, and also um, a culture where, you know, many of us, especially in fields like academia, are the type A personalities, right, where we really just want to strive and do our best. Um, so the first myth is that self-compassion is a form of, of self-pity, it it's not that, um, that it means weakness. Um, that it will make me complacent, so it will not make me work hard, that it will just I'll become very um, mediocre. Uh, another one is that it's narcissistic um, and, and selfish. And this has to apply a lot to women because we are uh, very much wired to, to want to give to others and not so much for ourselves, especially when um, when there's children involved, right? So, so many, I, I work with Latino women and they don't feel like they have the right to take 10 minutes for themselves. So this is just some of the research that's come out as it relates to mindfulness and compassion. Um, there's been uh, lots of research studies that have shown that it reduces PTSD, depression, anxiety, veterans, um, improves biological markers, um, it changes uh, in neuroplasticity. I'm not going to go into detail uh, into this, but um, I will be very happy to share my slides so you can have some of these um, references. And then just to, to end my presentation so that we have enough time for questions, um, as Todd mentioned at the beginning, we have been using mindfulness to, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't know what's happening. It's never been this loud, but <laughs> it's getting worse. I hope it's 
way. I hope the sound is coming through clearly. Um, but yeah, so this is a graph that I, I really like to show about the cognitive bias codex. And it's hundreds and hundreds of things that our brain is constantly thinking and doing. And so that we don't have to use so much of our rational mind, a lot of these things happen in the subconscious um, so that we can respond and react quickly. And they're categorized in different um, spheres, right? So when there's too, too much information, our brain will go quickly to one of these solutions in order to save energy and time. When there's not enough meaning, uh, when we need to act fast, um, when we, we should know what we should remember. So mindfulness um, is a practice that really helps us to awake to that sense. Clearly see how we are reacting and that the actions that we're taking and why we're taking them. So these are just a couple of studies that have shown how mindfulness and compassion training specifically can reduce implicit biases and prejudice. prejudice, prejudice. Um, so the first one is it's one that shows how after uh, mindfulness training, um, the implicit bias test for race and for age uh, improves and, and gets lower in the people that participated in a, in a uh, loving kindness um, uh, practice. And then the other one is uh, a study that was done uh, with people and how implicit bias against ho homeless people um, reduce after a six week loving, pra uh, loving kindness meditation practice. And the interesting thing here is that they found that what mediated that relationship was psychological stress. So I'm not going to go into detail about that in this presentation, but one of the things that we develop with our mindfulness practice is resilience. Uh, resilience to be able to stay with difficult situations, with difficult emotions, with having difficult conversations, which is why it is so crucial and it can be very central to the topic of anti-racism. Um, and, and, and just biases. So we've had the fortune to collaborate with Rhonda McGee. She was one of the presenters in our Mindfulness and Anti-Racism series. And she developed the definition of color insight. Um, she's the writer of the book, The Inner Work of Racial Justice. Um, so the definition of color insight is the capacity for understanding and working to redress racism and the pervasive dynamic operation of racialized social identity in our institutions and our lives through mindfulness and compassion practices and teachings. So through her work and through, through the wonderful book and, and, and workshops and everything that she has developed, we can really see how um, many of the root manifestations of, of racism are sometimes aversion to, to bodies, to culture. Um, she also really clearly explains how the role of self-compassion and self-acceptance can then open the door to accept others. Um, and I feel like that is something that gets doesn't get emphasized enough. You know, when we are when we are judging other people or criticizing other people, it is very hard for us to love them at the same time. And But that's what we do with ourselves, right? We're constantly judging ourselves, we're criticizing ourselves. Um, and these practices of mindfulness and self-compassion can really help us to, to develop that um, self uh, and that positive self-regard. So as um, Todd um, and Shanti mentioned at the beginning, I, I work with the Academy for Diversity and Inclusion and I have developed uh, foundations of, of an inclusive workplace uh, that specifically relates to mindfulness and mindfulness is a core um, capability capacity, a core capacity uh, for the mindfulness um, for the Academy and Diversity Inclusion Framework. Mm -hmm. So if you go to learn at work, there will be constantly um, I think every semester there will be trainings that are offered um, in, this, in this area. We have also created with Todd the Mindfulness Washu uh, group and we have a website so we really encourage you to visit this website and learn more about who we are and our aims. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we have a series on mindfulness and anti-racism uh, talks. We had Rhonda McGee back in April. In September, we had uh, Valerie Brown. And forthcoming in April of 22, we have the fortune to have um, Dr. Michael Yellowbird, who is a wonderful authority in the area of neurodecolonization and indigenous, indigenous mindfulness. Uh, and then just to close, we we Todd and my colleagues at the at the um, mindfulness group, we are proposing an idea for a center at WashU that will um, integrate research, education, practice, um, community outreach, um, and we're just really excited about this. So we're gathering support. We are uh, pitching this idea to everybody that we can because we do see um, having a mindfulness center at WashU was a very good asset for, for everybody. And that is it. These are some practices that I didn't get to, but I'm going to send them to the um, uh, to Shanti so she, you can share it with participants. Great. Thank you. So those, there. those were fabulous presentations, and I loved the exercise at the beginning. And both of you have such uh, Kind of mindful, peaceful speaking voices that it was really just, um, it was very, very powerful to hear about this new sort of research being done in this area. But we have some great questions in the Q&A, so I encourage people to put them there. I know we only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to start off and then I'm going to turn to some of the great questions that are being asked. So my question that I want to start with it's about bridging the two presentations and the combined work that you're doing. So the two parts of the talk, uh, both of you provided interesting perspectives on the benefits of mindfulness. Yet the two, to some people might seem very distinct. And Diana, you started to bring these together. And I wanted for you to elaborate on um, the, the project that both of you have, and as well as the work that you're doing on the mindfulness and anti-racism group. Um, how does mindfulness connect the dots between improving attention control and becoming more compassionate and addressing bias and prejudice? And for the sake of time, I'm going to also ask the second one that's related. So you don't have to answer both of these to both of you. But um, so you're, we're talking about mindfulness to be useful in diversity and equity inclusion efforts, yet research also suggests that racism and other forms of prejudice are not simply individual level, but are also structural, meaning they're historically ingrained problems in society. So I guess the first part is how do you connect, if you can elaborate a little bit on how you connect the two, but then second, how can mindfulness help address deeply seated problems that aren't just at the individual level. So I'll turn it over to both of you and then I'll open, I'll ask some of the questions that people have asked. Uh, you want to start first? Great. I'll yes. you do, do you want me to start first? Yeah, you, why don't you try to take that first and I can chime in afterwards. Sure. Um, yeah, so it's basically, you know, I think, <laughs> I was attending a, a retreat last week and it was a, it was a Zen meditation retreat and, 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 and the teacher said, um, Zen is mindfulness, but mindfulness is not Zen. And I'm just saying this because mindfulness is not, I, I think I really want to convey the, the fact that mindfulness is not something separate that we do. Uh, mind, we can bring mindfulness into everything we do in our life, right? So we can eat mindfully, we can eat mindfully, we can, and, and that just means being there, really being there. You know, many of us have experiences where we've been so involved with an activity that we forget that we're doing it, right? Like we're, like they call it in the zone. Um, so this is all to say that they're not separate, you know, this attention control or, 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 training our mind so that it doesn't get distracted and compassion they're one and the same they they're different aspects that but we can train them in the same way we can train them in 
allowing our capacity to to see with difficult feelings with difficult emotions with staying with what is happening right now even if it's uncomfortable even if um if we're getting you know distracted or, or frustrated that we can focus on our breath more than a minute um so it's, it's it's a constant practice right it's a constant practice and they both strengthen the muscle of self-compassion and attention thank you todd yeah i mean just to add to uh what diana was saying i think as, as somebody who studies attention is very interesting i think really part of the mindfulness practice is understanding um the being attentive to our own thoughts, our own feelings, being able to be present with those, even when we have powerful emotions and to not be overwhelmed from that and to also not turn away from that. And so the practice of mindfulness allows us to get more in touch, hold our attention and detect when, oh, I'm having a strong emotional reaction. I'm having these thoughts that are coming up um, maybe unbidden, maybe unwanted, um, but I, I'm going to let them be there and I'm going to notice that they are maybe causing a tendency for me to want to act in a particular way, but maybe that's a way that I realize isn't, you know, consistent with my values or goals um, by being attentive to the way I feel when I'm doing a compassion practice and being able to kind of hold my attention, I can strengthen, detect what are those feelings of compassion that may be arising in my body and my mind and be able to kind of hold and, and strengthen that connections that are being made there so that the next time it becomes more automatic to do that. It's not something that we have to kind of work as hard, but that's a kind of automatic reaction that we're training our brain to be able to do. So um, there's a lot of aspect of this that is inner work. And in fact, um, you know, one of the phrases that Rhonda McGee says that I really love is she talks about the inner work of racial justice, that um, in order to be effective in making actions in the world, we also have to be effective in, in being able to regulate ourselves and understand our own responses to events that are happening, our interactions with others. And so if we start inwardly, um, we can utilize that in tandem with, it's not like these are the only things that are important. Obviously, as you said, um, you know, prejudice and racism are these huge ingrained problems that um, we need, you know, public policy changes, we need to, to do lots of external things. But it seems like part of the barrier is that um, it's for people that are experiencing racism, there's a lot of emotional regulation that need in coping skills that um, we can you know, maybe be more effective so that we can go out and, um, and interact in a more effective way for people that have, um, we all have biases, we need to be able to understand them when they come up and see how they might be influencing our thoughts and behavior. So there's this kind of tandem, I think, of working together um, with our own inner work and then being able to more effectively work um, outwardly um, to enact the changes that need to be made. And so, um, you know, that's, I think, one of the, the goals that we are trying to promote with this anti-racism series is to the people who have been really thought leaders in, in describing that kind of those connections to, to help people see and connect the dots and, and hopefully with the work of our center, be able to engage in some um, external practices as well and some external actions that will help further for this, this kind of important work. Great, great, thank you. And we have time for one more, but I do wanna point out to the to people watching that they are answering some of the questions in the Q&A answer section. So the ones that they did not have a chance. So I'm going to read another one um, and my apologies to the audience for having to kind of select which ones, all of this is so fascinating. But I was curious, um, there's some questions about sort of, uh, research around the idea of um, how long does somebody have to practice or, and I guess length would also then have to be correspond with sort of the effectiveness and how they're doing it. But could you talk a little bit about what research says about when, when we start to notice some of these changes, uh, neurological changes in the brain? And is it different for age or gender or 
uh, even race. Yeah, I mean, I can take that one. That that um, it's a great question, and the the first part is we still need to know about um, in you know individual differences and different um, effects of mindfulness for different populations. That's still an area of active research. I can tell you that um, you know there's there's programs that there's research that have shown that even um, single practice can actually have some short term effects right then and there in terms of compassionate responding, improvements in attention and focus, you know, the things that we need that are more long lasting and are gonna be more um, durable changes, those do require uh, more extended practice. Um, mm -hmm. The programs like the MBSR, which is an eight week program, have, found, have been shown to, to, to produce some pretty um, robust effects as I was mentioned in the beginning. And um, there hasn't been enough study of like long-term follow-up but it does seem to be that uh, they, they are pretty uh, effective and they seem to be there at least, you know, in the shorter term follow-up studies that have been done. But um, I would say, you know, my main advice is that people who are interested, think about it like any kind of fit or training practice, something that you can start, you know, and, and build up and make a routine, a part of your life, just like you might make exercising or brushing your teeth, you know, something that you do. And you know, when you brush your teeth, you're not gonna, you know, end the, the tendency for cavities from one toothbrushing. But if you're doing it on a regular basis, you're building up the strength and the resilience of your teeth to, to you know, to be able to uh, deal with all the, the chemicals uh, and, yeah. and decay that's happening. And so if you think about that mental training, that's maybe what, what the way I would think about okay. mindfulness training. So then one last question, we have a minute and a half. If both of you, so, Folks who have never practiced this, so we're going to get off this Zoom. All of us are multitasking, live in a stressful, have stressful lives. What is the one way we all can begin? Give us a tangible way. As soon as we get off, if you want to start this today, what's one thing that we can do that's accessible? I, I think I, I want to um, tackle that and, and go and touch a little bit on the prior question, and is let go of us, let go of the goal, let go of the end result choose you know your morning coffee when you wake up from bed maybe like just don't check your phone immediately just just one thing but don't really have like an end point in mind you know we're such a culture of like that question i love that question right because it's like how much do you need like we're obsessed with like measuring right we we also want results right away and if you if you set yourself up that way sometimes you set up yourself up for failure because you get discouraged right you have an expectation of exactly how something needs to look or the result that you want and that might not happen so i guess my one thing is just really bring yourself to what you're doing fully and engaging in, in that you know we like practice that when your family members are talking to you when your kids are talking to you when you're talking to a colleague uh, to your mom or or brushing your teeth or drinking your coffee in the morning. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. Thank you, this was fascinating. I think we could go on and on uh, just listening to the suggestions and the research. So we've reached the end of our time. I would like to thank Diane and Todd for a very thought provoking discussion on the power of mindfulness. And many thanks to those of you who have joined us today. As I mentioned at the start of event, the new strategic plan for arts and sciences was just made public. We, will, we would like to end by sharing a video that celebrates the new vision for arts and sciences and a link to the strategic plan will, will be in the chat for everybody. Thank you, Todd, Diane, and a round of applause for you and thank you to the audience. And we invite you to watch the video. Our campus sits near the confluence of two ancient rivers ecosystems merge and thrive in our midst. Our region has seen diverse cultures take root, fight for survival, and reach toward greatness. A host of resources, historical and cultural, innovative and intellectual, enrich our work. They draw us to engage with our city, with each other, and with communities around the globe. Our school, Arts and Sciences, represents a convergence of ideas, ideas that shape our understanding of the world, 
and indeed the world itself. We will elevate scholarship that is creative and ambitious by embracing new ideas, emerging technologies, and shifting paradigms. We will honor and promote the pursuit and discovery of knowledge. We will seek distinction in cutting edge scholarship and push boundaries both within and among disciplines to meet the most critical challenges facing our communities and our planet. We will find new ways to tell our story, to share the matter and meaning behind our work. We are an institution devoted to bringing people together to serve the public good. Our partnerships here in St. Louis and across the region will identify shared goals and we will pursue academic and educational excellence that positively impacts our communities. We will forge critical connections from the local to the global, expanding solutions and imparting lasting impacts on the world within our own community. Faculty, staff, and students of all identities will feel valued, represented, and equally empowered to pursue their goals. Here, we will create meaningful connections with our peers, our mentors, and the St. Louis community. We will gather knowledge and learn how to apply it to build lives filled with meaning and purpose. We will go out into the world as engaged, active, 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 and impactful members of our communities. Together, our voices will rise to shape the next decade and all the decades to come. We are ready. The time is now. Welcome to the Decade of Arts and Sciences.